Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. Coming up on the programme this week. I had extreme anxiety. I couldn't leave the apartment, couldn't leave the bedroom. I ended up with quite severe depression. I hit rock bottom like a lot of people do. And obviously you focus on the breaking of that trauma cycle. But if we don't have the understanding, if we don't have the right methods we can't break that cycle and then the trauma is it's constantly living with you presumably and you won't necessarily know that that's what's going on because it's 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 trauma is so sneaky it gets into your personality and your identity to such a degree it shapes your belief system that you think what you think and feel is normal actually it's far from normal. And I'll be reminding you how you can make connections with mental health organisations within your community. It's Mental Health Monday. The home of the UK's conversation about mental health. It's Mental Health Monday, episode 248. Now, I'm just waiting to dot some I's and cross some T's for our special guest and a special event for episode 250. Um, I can't say it just yet, but hopefully... We've got something sorted, which should be a bit special, a little bit different, and hopefully with a live studio audience as well. Um, if that doesn't play out, you'll just hear episode 250 go, and it'll just be normal, and I won't mention it. Uh, but fingers crossed we've got something lined up, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to hopefully dotting the I's, I say, and crossing the T's to make it all come together in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, bank holiday weekend this weekend, so if you're checking us out on the day the pub podcast is released or even the day after or even the week or month after uh, you're very welcome to the program and to the conversation we've got the author of a new book on the program today wendy keir is our guest now the book is called uh, hashtag be more wolf a survivor's story breaking the trauma cycle now you can find this in uh, uh, amazon's a good place for it. it's been as we'll hear uh, topping a number of their various different charts as well and, and it talks through uh, wendy's life uh, the trauma that she experienced, uh, but also how she's sort of learned to deal with that trauma, sort of the skill set that she's picked up, and now how she helps other people deal with trauma. And trauma is one of those things which, in and of itself, the trauma isn't a mental health problem. But of course, mental health problems, the way we view ourselves, the way we view the world, can of course be hugely, hugely impacted by trauma. So it's very much uh, in the, the spectrum of conversations that we have here on Mental Health Monday. It can have a huge impact on people's lives, um, from the most severe trauma um, to those things that might not impact some people, and yet for other people may be huge and may have a long and lasting legacy. Issues of, you know, triggering a uh, lack of understanding of a trauma that uh, that happened to them, and maybe a lack of education around what trauma is, the damage that it can do, and the issues, of course, that it can raise in our lives, maybe not straight away, maybe 10 years down the line, 20 years, 30 years down the line. And it can also take that long, as we'll hear on the programme today, uh, to tackle some of those traumas and to deal with the impacts of those traumas in our lives. Wendy is our guest, a really great talker. Uh, we started off by talking about the book and actually the success that she's had since it was published. Yeah, so I'm really pleased it's in some great categories, but what I would consider to be a great category, like um, violence against women, um, sexual abuse. So it's hovering around the top 10 in sexual abuse and it regularly hits number one. and you know, the violence against women, I think it sits in the in the top 50. But Amazon's tricky. You know, it has a different platform for every country. So depending on how many books you're selling in which country it will depend on where you fluctuate in the Amazon charts. I guess it's a sign, though, that, 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 it's, that it's hitting the right notes. And I guess when you start writing a book and you're thinking, will it connect? Will it reach the people who I hope it reaches? I guess this is maybe a sense that, that it is it's finding those yeah. those people that you really wanted it to to reach yeah and it has such a specific audience it's not a book that you would pick up and read at your leisure it's a book that you would pick up and read if you've experienced something bad that's happened in your childhood or if you're a professional you know if you're a social worker a doctor working on frontline it's the type of book that is quite specific it it's not a book where you go oh, i'm going to read this over the weekend people describe it as harrowing which i 
I'm not sure it's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> it, it, it's so interesting that I noticed someone on someone on social media. I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago on the on the program. Uh, was talking about the phrase "lived experience," and they were being a little bit sniffy about it. Going, "Oh, when did experience become lived experience?" And actually, this is a really good example of it. That if someone goes, "Do you have experience of trauma?" It might be something that you remember or that something that you know a friend of yours went through or something you briefly touched upon. Um, and you could say, yeah, I do have experience of it because of this. But actually lived experience is, no, well, this was my life. You know, this is, yeah. I am the survivor of this story. This wasn't just something that was happening. This was, this was you know, something that was defining my very existence for a period yeah. of time. And actually when, when survivors tell their stories, I think they get a real sense of that phrase, lived experience. Absolutely makes sense and that's that's the story you're telling in the in the book first and foremost can we start by by talking about your your story i think it will everyone there'll be people who have trauma and have the same sorts of experiences uh in terms of the impacts on life but everyone of course everyone's story will be different and the reasons for the trauma will be will be different as well i understand yours were sort of born out from being placed in in social care at a very young yeah. age yeah, so I was removed from my dad at the age of two. He was an alcoholic and he used to leave me and my brother all over the place, go and get drunk, leave us, we'd get taken into care. Then eventually they took us into care full time. And during that time, I had over 30 foster placements. I had that level of foster placements. And then for some crazy reason, someone thought it'd be a really good idea for me to become adopted. So I was adopted when I was about 12 and a half. But, you know... In the care system, till still to this day, or when you're adopting a child, there's very little support for the carers to be able to manage someone who has been traumatised to that degree. So that only lasted a couple of, year, couple of years, and then I went back into the care system. So I'm absolutely a big believer that if trauma isn't addressed if it isn't resolved if it isn't healed if it isn't reframed in the mind that it will breed more trauma a bit like stress a bit like anxiety anxiety breeds more anxiety stress breeds more stress trauma breeds more trauma so it just if you've had a lot of traumatic experiences in your childhood you will find yourself in quite challenging and quite difficult situations when you become an adult because you are still living your life through the trauma you experienced growing up and you won't necessarily know that that's what's going on because it's 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 trauma is so sneaky it gets into your personality and your identity to such a degree it shapes your belief system that you think what you think and feel is normal actually it's far from normal and it's far from what other people experience who haven't been through trauma. This is the difference between a lived experience and somebody who's got the qualifications and uh, the theoretical understanding. There's a big difference between someone who's got a lived experience and somebody who's got a theoretical knowledge. And one of my reasons for writing the book was that trauma is a very complicated subject. When I listen to people talking about trauma, I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? How do I apply that into my life today to actually make a difference? So I think that's the difference for me. Lived experiences, it's, it's the rawness of it. You're in it, you're in the emotion of it. And the not having a lived experience is very theoretical, very knowledge-based. Let's apply this theory to what that person's experiencing and it sort of removes the control from the person who's actually experiencing the trauma. Sorry, I know I'm darting, I'm darting all over the place. I'm sort no, of connecting no, no. the dots I, in my mind. I think I think that absolutely, I think that absolutely makes sense. And I think actually, and we'll touch on within the the, the book breaking the trauma cycle. This idea that this 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 incident um, has impacts, and mm -hmm. that impact then, of course. Can then make the original incident seem worse and actually become a, a, a big part of of someone's life and obviously you focus on the breaking of that that trauma cycle but if we don't have the understanding if we don't have the right methods we can't break that cycle and then the trauma is is constantly living with you presumably you're constantly triggered is what happens you become emotionally triggered so something small can happen and um 
I was thinking a, a couple of years ago, I was in Bangkok and um, I've always had a, a, a funky money story, which means I don't have a very good story when it comes to um, um, money. And I put my bank card in the machine and it didn't work. And I just went into full on panic, fear. And that was me being emotionally triggered by something that had happened in my past and I could not snap out of it. So it took me a couple of days to, to realize what happened emotionally because I'd been triggered and then work, my, work myself out of it as quickly as I could. But So that's just a small trigger. But what will happen for people who've experienced trauma is that they'll become emotionally hijacked. So it will last weeks and it will last months and it can last even longer because they're in that loop and pattern of believing something to be true when it isn't necessarily true. And they think that's their pers personality and their, the way they are, but it's actually not. It's just a self-defense mechanism to, to help them cope. I mean, to help I, them cope with what's going It's an illusion. It's just, an, it's just all an illusion. <laughs> Well, and I think this is absolutely fascinating because, of course, hopefully, you know, people who hopefully are listening to this conversation, people you've spoken to, will be aware of sort of mental health and well-being and those sort of uh, what it is and the fact that when things happen to us, it impacts on our lives. But I, I wonder, Wendy, how many people are going and living their lives who have experienced a trauma but don't have that as a, as a label or something that they know about so that if something like you, the bank incident happens to them, they just think, well, that's just how I respond. That's just how I am. Yeah. That's that's the sort of person that I am. Whereas actually there's, as you've described there, a quite a clear reason and quite a clear psychological process is, is going yeah. on in our heads. But of course, if we don't know about those things, if we don't understand that we've experienced a trauma or, or whatever that thing might be, and that might be a grief point or it might be um, you know, a, um, a triggering of, of, a, of a former incident of violence, whatever it might be. If we don't understand that, then we won't mm. understand why other things are happening to us. And of course, that then has a, has a, a, a yeah. damaging impact, doesn't it, on, on people's ways of thinking? Absolutely. Absolutely. They should really teach this stuff at school. They should really teach how to manage thoughts, how we process thinking, how we manage our emotions, because they're, they're much easier to, well, for me, I've learned that it's actually quite easy for me now to manage my emotions once I've understood what's going on but you know for a lot of people this will be for a lot of people as well I had extreme anxiety I couldn't leave the apartment couldn't leave the bedroom I um, ended up with quite se severe depression and I hit rock bottom like a lot of people do and I discovered this guy called um, Joe Dispenza he's an American guy and he talks about you can reshape your personality, you can reshape your thoughts, but he does it from a scientific medical point of view. Um, but I just absolutely fell in love with him, F followed his, read his books, took on board what he was saying. And from that point, I woke up and realized that actually I had a choice to take my life in the same direction and keep having depression, keep having anxiety, or to actually slowly break that learned behavior, because that's all it is, learned behavior, and to create a new path and to head off in, in that direction. So it was that real bit of, actually, I am in control of what's going on. I can become a different person. I can choose to live my life a certain way. And the problem is when people get triggered, they're on automatic pilot. They don't realize that they have a choice. They just think it's who they are and it's set in stone and that's it. But it's taken me 50 years to realize that. <laughs> so don't think I got it at the beginning. But I think that's, I think that's fascinating because actually what, what it tells you is if you do get an opportunity to educate yourself, you can then mm. learn and apply something which can then make a, make a difference. Can I ask you about that? You've spoken before about incidents that happened to you when you were in the, the care sort of system but at what point when we talk about realizing that there is an issue that needs to be tackled at what point in your life did you think what what has happened to me and my experience is wrong and I'm not 
to blame for those things. And actually, I deserve a to have time. a better yeah. life. At, at what point yeah, did you suddenly go, I oh, hang, hang on, hang on. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've read loads of books, done loads of training, spent 20 years working with young people at risk in voluntary sector and social services. So I'd done all the training, but there was a, a, there was a detachment between... So I completely re-traumatized myself. There was a detachment between reading about it, doing the theory, and actually applying it to myself as a person. So I was in such a high level of denial, and I would say things like that, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't, you know, I didn't have it that bad, which is just complete denial of my own experiences. So it would have been about 48 starting to realize that I could, and after having the depressive episode and the anxiety, is that's when I realized that actually I needed to relearn everything. I needed to relearn everything that I thought um, about how I was seeing life. And that sounds really big, but it's actually not that big. It's the difference between, um, uh, it's the difference between between literally being closed off, not being able to talk to anybody. You know, I, I was closed off, couldn't talk to anybody to the complete opposite of that and opening yourself up to be able to um, expand and receive it emotionally. So it's like either all or none. Well, can, can, can I ask you about that? And I know you touch on it in the book, actually. And let's 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 come on to it now because I think it's a, it's a really interesting point. There will be some people, I imagine, who at the point of realization of something has happened to me, which I need to need to deal with, maybe a sense of fear that to deal with it you need to fully explore it. But to fully explore it is to take you back to a place in which you are scared and traumatized or upset mm. or vulnerable and all all of those things. So. How can you make sure that if you do step into understanding an incident in the past or series of incidents in the past, that they don't become then damaging, that you don't, you don't, you don't delve too deep uh, in, yeah. in, in, in an unsafe way? Yeah, I'm not a fan of delving deep. I'm a fan of... Um, so I very much work on what's showing up now. So a lot of the women that I've worked with have an issue with being visible, of being seen. So there's something underneath that that's stopping them from being visible and being seen and being heard. So we take a helicopter view and we think, we go, okay, what was the incident before that that happened? Can you remember a time when something happened where you felt you couldn't be visible? So we don't go into it, but we just go, okay, so that created that behaviour. Can you think of a time before that? We go back. Okay, what happened then? But not not del not delving into the rawness and you know getting a visual image. Just very quickly having a look at, and then going back again and just connecting these dots so you can understand why you why you are behaving the way you're behaving. Once you understand why you behave the way you behave and why you think the way you think, you can then make a decision as to where, how you want things to move forward. But there is a piece in the middle, which is really about, you know, acknowledging the trauma and the pain and being able to release it. So there's a level of containment, but also at the same time, there's another piece wrapped within that, which is like, who actually do you want to be now in this present moment? Because all trauma does is it, means that you're living in the past you're not living in the now and you're not living in the in the future you're basically your behavior is predictable from the past so what we do is we you know okay why do you think you're behaving this way do you have a sense of that okay let's acknowledge it acknowledge the pain of that who is it that you want to be in this present moment going forward and then we slowly step into that that brings a lot of fear but you have to manage that fear. So this is why it's helpful to know how to manage your thoughts and your emotions and how to manage the, the fear that's playing out and then slowly step in, stepping into that. Once you start slowly stepping into it, you release, you release the energe energetic hold that trauma has on you in that moment. So you're not paralyzed in your, the rawness of the emotions, 
you've sort of slowly come out of it and you're and you're moving forward and you're making different decisions based on what's in your best interest in the here and now not in the crappy past absolutely you just use the phrase containment and in my head i was trying to imagine like placing the incident and the trauma into a box like yeah. and then having that box that box still exists and it lives in your in your sort of your mind's attic sort of thing and i guess yeah. you've got to get it it's got to be a, at a safe level it can't be oozing out everywhere you've got to have it contained and, yeah. and so that it, it obviously doesn't cause problems down the line can i can i ask you what what in i don't know if this is something which is possible to explain but <laughs> what emotion <laughs> what emotion do you attach to what's in the box now that's a really interesting one. I still um, am quite a det- I'm still am quite a detached person in terms of my emotions, and I have to really consciously sink it, sink into the rest of my body to feel it. Me and a client always used to have a joke because I, I basically used to be cut off from the neck. I just used to live in my head. The rest of my body just didn't exist. <laughs> so I um feel actually quite detached from it so there's no energetic connection to it which is great for me there's no energetic connection to it I think it's a very important part of who I am but it just doesn't consume who I am every now and again it will that box will rattle and then I have to bring it back down again it doesn't mean it's resolved for life for me it just means that I manage my trauma consciously all the time. It's a bit like a, um, um, an addict or an alcoholic, is that I manage it on an ongoing basis. It's not a, oh, I've dealt with that, it's over. I think of trauma recovery as ongoing. Do you ever sort of, um, sort of assess your sort of journey, if you like, your, your narrative? I think sometimes we, we sort of live our lives, don't we, and we think that, well, this is our life, so this is all that we know. But of course, if it was happening to somebody else or someone that you need, you'd go, goodness me, 30 different foster care pl- placements. You know, of, of, mm. of course that's going to have an impact on on someone's sort of sense of sort of place and being and belonging and all, all of that. That will be completely understandable. But sometimes if it's you, you kind of go, well, this is all that I know. Do you, do you ever take a time to almost sort of look at your experience from, I'm sort of leaning across here to sort of explain that, yeah. from a different point of view and kind of go, well, if this if this was happening to somebody else now, of course I would recognise that maybe some of the things that were happening would have a long-term impact, a foreseeable long-term impact. Yeah. Writing the book really helped. Writing the book is the best therapy I have ever had because I could process at a much deeper at a much deeper level and I could connect the dots even more I could connect the dots to my behavior that I'd never seen before um, but when I when I yeah I've really got a level of detachment from from my past so it, it's quite it's quite safe in that box and <laughs> now whereas before I was, I, the box was everywhere. You know, I was in it, it was like, there was no box, there were, was no containment, there was no, um, there was no peace. I was always bouncing from one, one thing to the next. So I would see it in someone else, like I see it in other people now, but when I think of myself, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure I really see it unless I've really dropped into the emotion of it. Then I see it, then I see it and feel it. Uh, the book is called um, Be More Wolf, A Survivor's Story and Breaking the Trauma Cycle. We touched on the trauma cycle before. Let's talk about being more wolf. What, what are the aspects of being a wolf that you found to be sort of uh, beneficial to draw in, if you like? Yeah, so when I woke up and, and said to myself, um, God, everything I've learned, sorry, my cat is called shaking the laptop meaning there's a looks like there's an earthquake that's fine I thought um, I thought you were going to say it was a wolf then but <laughs> <laughs> yeah so when I realized that what I'd learned wasn't the best way to learn I had to I went on this quest to find what were the traits what were the characteristics that I wanted to have so the, there was the wolf there was the um divine 
divinely feminine and there was the wild woman but I really like the wolf because one of the the wolf is great at is it has no attachment to the outcome so I really like and have really lent into having no attachment to people places um, whether I get a client or not and that has helped me significantly. So I had all of these different traits, characteristics of the wolf. And when I was struggling with something, I would just look at them and I would go, okay, I'm going to step into that. That's how I'm gonna deal with this issue. I'm gonna step into how the wolf would behave, some of those qualities. So that's how I use the wolf on those two of those two other characters. So yeah, really, really, really powerful. Does that, does that though, does that level of detachment, does it still give you the option of becoming attached or finding a connection with, with the things that you want to be connected with, do you think? I think I'm still experimenting. I think I'm still learning. I think I'm still experimenting. Trust was obviously always a very big issue for me. So I'm learning <laughs> at this age to trust to trust the per people who are in my inner circle. So I think I'm, I'm very much still learning. I'm like a baby. You know, I'm, I really am like very conscious of um, what's, go what's going on in my head and the relationships that I have and how I'm thinking about those relationships. And that's why the divinely feminine is good because she's all about love, compassion, see everything through love. It's very different. It's, as again, it's the opposite of how I use how I used to think, which was fear. You're all evil. You want to kill me. Do other things to me. So I very much step into that all of all of the time. So it's like a baby relearning, relearning until it's until it come, becomes normal. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that, that it's not then just the wolf, but it's those other aspects. You can almost just pull pull in the part of the narrative which you feel is relevant. Yeah to you and I guess if you didn't have those things you might think right well where do I turn I think sometimes people look for those things don't they those sort of sense of well what what's the it's not it's not the it's not the not the, what's the wider stuff but it, it, it sometimes allows you to place things within a, a context doesn't it or yeah. an order within your mind like to think parent. it's like a, really ultimately what those characters are are parents are guides are our sisters our brothers they are the true qualities of what I would like from somebody. And you couldn't, you have, to, I had to have all three to balance because you couldn't just be a wolf because wolves are pretty ruth ruthless. So I needed the divine feminine to balance the love and connection to balance the wolf out, but have the wolf as that level of, um, of as a level of detachment. And then have the wild woman who's, I'm not even sure what the wild woman is anymore now. <laughs> I lean mainly into the other two at the moment. <laughs> but 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 the wild woman's there if if, if you need if you need to yeah. join the wild woman. No, it's, I think it's I think that's really really interesting that we have these sort of um, sort of ideas in our head because I think we all try and frame ourselves, don't we, within um, either what we what we hope to be or maybe what we've seen before might be parents or friends groups or sort of what our societal expectation and 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 if you if they're helpful then of course that can help yeah. us to grow and then. Of course, the other flip side is that sometimes people naturally grow up seeing those, having those experiences, but they're from a negative point of view. It might be, you know, a, a problematic yeah. people within their life and they naturally move towards those behaviours because it's what they think they're supposed to do. Whereas actually, you you talked about that very, I think, brilliantly about making sure that, that those are positive things and, and allow you to be proactive and positive when you face those uh, uh, scenarios can I ask you as well uh, just to, almost to, to wrap this up as much as anything Wendy just about about finding yourself when you've had mm. incidents of trauma in the past and there's a sense that there there is this hangover these incidents and the the box keeps overflowing and and so forth mm. do you get to the point now where you feel like I'm I'm me now I can be myself and I can define myself can it's, I'm not going to say it's easy to get to that point. It must be incredibly mm -hmm. difficult. But do you do you feel like you're there? That when you are with yourself in a moment, you can you can say, "This is me, and I've I've earned this moment, if you like." And this is this is the very best of me. Um, or, or 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 is there such a hangover to some of those problems 
that there'll always be the, the shadow, if yeah. you Yeah, like. yeah. I, I think I'm probably for probably about 55% of the way there. So still very much, still very much, I'm probably being disingenuous, but I know how hard I have to work at it. And I know how easy it is to slip back into that old, um, that old mindset. So I have to work at it. I'd say about 55% or 60%. And I, I will slip back and I will slip back and something will happen and I won't realize I've been, I've been triggered. And then I'll start climbing out of that box, not consciously, unconsciously. And I'll come up and I'll go, oh, there I am. <laughs> like Peter Pan. Oh, there I am. <laughs> Like, ah, so that's what was that's what was going on. Now, I think, I think, yeah, I think you've you've summarised that. What a great answer, you know, the the fifty five percent, the climbing out, the climbing out of the box. No, absolutely, because I think it was uh, as much as anything. Because we are as human beings, aren't we? We're essentially that we are the um, we are existing in a world where lots of other things have happened to us. But yeah. I guess you can't take away the things that have happened, but we can choose or we can find a way to either let those things either define us or not define us or compartmentalize yeah. or to look yeah. elsewhere and so on and so on and so forth. So, but I think what you've absolutely said there is, um, and forgive me, I've got this wrong, but that, that it's a journey. That it's, it's a it's, journey. Yeah, it's really a journey. And it's a journey that life's hard. You know, if I hadn't even gone through this trauma, life is hard. Let's face it, it's not easy for anybody. Um, but it is a journey and it's, it's whether you choose to deal with things consciously or not. It's your choice, ultimately. And you mentioned, you touched on this earlier on, and this is such a big, big one. And it is literally about education and knowledge. The education and the knowledge is missing. If people had access to the education and knowledge, they would have be more informed, they would be able to make better decisions and better choices for themselves. It's because they don't have access to that education that people aren't able to heal and they get stuck into a system that just isn't going to, isn't going to serve them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's that thing where you've got to be proactive on that because you've got to be saying to people when they're young, if, you know, yeah. life is going to throw lots at you and not all of it is going to be good. And when it's bad, these are the impacts it can have unless these steps are sort of taken. And that education is yeah. it's obviously out there because people like yourself have, have been able to find it and then obviously create your own resources um, like, like the book now. But I, th it, I think that fits into that much wider conversation, doesn't it, about how we prepare young people to face the world and then what we then throw at these young people that they've then yeah. got to deal with. It's the difficult issues, aren't they? There's just such denial on such so many different layers, you know, society, the media, schools, the police, the whole system is built on denial. So it's really hard for people to break free and find their own way because not only have they got to deal with the internal resistance of the fear of not wanting to look at it, but then they've got all of this other stuff around them that's telling them not to and that they're bad and it's, it's not good. So it's... But I think as human beings as well, naturally, the easiest thing to do is accept the status quo and try and move with it. Like that's that's the yeah. easiest. And people do it in politics, don't you? See politicians doing yeah. anything. You don't actually believe that, do you? But really what they're saying <laughs> is, look, this just keeps me in a job for another six months if I just go along with it. You know, if you look at look at look at the people who are siding with, you know, the, the, the violence in, in Ukraine and so on and so mm -hmm. forth on the various and awful, but then <laughs> sometimes you're hearing people go oh maybe maybe he's got a point they think well it's just easier to think that because then it's, then then it, then it, then you can accept in your own mind the the scenario that you've seen as opposed to thinking this isn't right this isn't good something needs to be done yeah. about this but it's so easy isn't it just to say you know yeah. what let's just let's just move with with it and actually if we if we if we do that what we do is we tell the next generation to say just like lump it and if you can't lump it, that's your problem, as opposed to accepting that there are much wider problems in society and yeah. society's got some major problems that we all need to deal with uh, as, a, as a group. Absolutely. The, well, I'm lost for words now. I'm lost for words because it is incredibly complicated and society has a way of coping, which people get swept up in, which isn't necessarily the 
the right way to um, cope. No, <laughs> I don't exactly. think I explained that very no, well. No, I think uh, there's, there's so much in that conversation, isn't it, about coping <laughs> resilience. And that sometimes people say, like, if you're coping, but sometimes you've got to cope with life, haven't you? You've got to cope with, you know, negative thoughts or cope with difficult yeah. situations, cope with difficult people yeah. as that well. Is life. And there is, but then it, it, it comes to a point where, like, if that coping is is chip, chip, chipping away at you and you're thinking, well, are you coping? If actually, in the end, you're having a negative experience, um, as opposed to improving our resilience and improving the resilience of young people so that when difficult stuff does happen, they have, first, mm -hmm. they have the, the protection element of the resilience, but then at the same time, they also have a recognition that they don't, they shouldn't have to keep facing difficult things all the time. And there comes a point when those difficult things need to either be taken away from them or they need to be removed from that, from that environment yeah. as well. But I think it's a whole different way of thinking, isn't it? That we don't necessarily have, particularly in the in the in the UK with 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 culture, that there is a sense of, well, if you don't like it, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, phrases like that. They're the sorts of yeah, phrases. Yeah, very English. Yeah, yeah, the sort of go-to things that we talk. Denial. Yeah, Just no, denial. Absolutely. Because it's easier Just to say, denial. oh, it's easier to say, oh, was the kitchen too hot for you? That's your problem. As opposed to someone going, actually, the kitchen's on fire and yeah. the house is going <laughs> to yeah. burn down. It's easy. Like, we should be going there. But instead we go, oh, you know, too too, too hot for you. As it was like, yeah, it was literally 800 degrees now. It's the, you know, we, you, we should probably do something about that. Oh, no, it's yeah. your problem. Because then it becomes, they're the problem, and the house burning down isn't isn't the problem. But that, that's about which the one. English stiff up a lip. Ab I fit that yeah, real, den real denial. I I think um, someone was saying that was created from the last war. I don't know how... Oh, well, I, I, I've, I, you know, and I've said, I've said this many times, I've had this conversation on the programme about keep calm and carry on. You know, and all of those things that were yeah. born out of, even if things are really difficult, just carry on. And that was a, that was a poster to get us through literally being bombed every night like that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's, well, it's actually, but then but then we moved on from that as a country because we weren't getting bombed every night. But, but we, we, didn't. we kept we kept those same mindsets yeah. um, of of if stuff's happening, stiff up a lip, crack on. And uh, and everything will be fine. Whereas quite clear, even Winston Churchill lived with you know lived with with depression, you know. But but, but we still have this thing of oh yes, or oh, Winston Churchill wouldn't have would wouldn't have said that because he was this wartime leader. He was living with depression. He had all sorts of issues as a result of that. Uh, but those are the mindsets I think that we grow up with um, that obviously need yeah, to change. It's, it's crazy, and that that collective trauma was never healed. It was taken as a norm. People had it as a norm. So it was never processed. It was never resolved. It was too painful for people to get to address it. So they just moved through it. It's just like layer upon layer of unresolved emotions that have never really been, never really been looked at. Yeah, absolutely. It's just toxic it's just more toxic on top of more toxic and now with everything else that's going on in the world it's even more difficult to uh, navigate no absolutely and i think if you think about those historic tales that have never been told you know that the 19 year old who lived through the trenches of world war one and then mm. as a 40 year old lives through the blitz and the bombs 20 years on the trauma from 20 years previously going through those are yeah, those are stories that we that haven't been told and we feel like we know yeah. all the stories from the war because we know about x y or z but actually if you think about what is that experience of somebody who at the age of 19 lost everyone they ever knew in the in the trenches and 20 years later maybe with a family they wanted to protect and a house and all of those things living mm. through you know air raids or being even called up again to fight in another war 20 the, there must be unbelievable stories probably that will never be told because the people aren't around anymore but imagine yeah. that collective trauma that would have been at that time yes. that would have Surrender. been absolutely huge. And of course, and the impact it has on the children of those people um, and, the, and the experiences that, that they had as well. So I think it, it just goes to show that the trauma is there, whether it's got a big capital T over the top of it or yeah, whether or, or not it's those un, un, yeah. untold, uh, those untold stories. Well, I always think of trauma as just an event that changes your behavior that should change your behavior to such a degree that you do things consciously and unconsciously to avoid being in that situation again. So I always think of trauma like that because you always get people judging 
you know, I'd said it earlier about, oh, it wasn't that bad. You know, I didn't have it that bad, um, playing, playing it down. So it doesn't matter whether it's a small T or a big T, if, if it's an event that has affected you to such a degree that you change your behavior and you live your behavior by that based on something that's happened in the past, to me, that's trauma. Absolutely. Uh, the, the book is out now. Uh, people can find it. If you type in Be More Wolf, uh, breaking the trauma cycle or and and or a survivor's story in there as well y you'll find it by wendy kier uh k-i-e-r that's k-i-e-r type that into uh, the well-known uh websites where you can buy these sorts of books um i think we all know we're talking about the one called amazon uh but be more wolf <laughs> by wendy kier thank you so much for your time and it's really fascinating conversation good luck with the book i know it's been a big success uh already and i know it'll continue to be a, a, a an important resource for many different people so thanks for joining us on mental health monday thanks for your time I hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. Thanks for checking out Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Mick Coyle. You can also find me, Mick Coyle, on Facebook as well. Don't forget, if you want to speak to somebody about your mental health, you can do so. The Samaritans, uh, free to call on 116 123. You can find mental health services where you are. Just look for the Hub of Hope. Type in your postcode. It'll find those mental health services close to you. And for support in a crisis, you can text SHOUT to 85258. That's if you're experiencing a personal crisis and you're unable to cope and need support. Uh, shout to 85258. That's a text line. Do get involved in those services. In an absolute emergency, always remember the number to call is 999. Thanks for downloading the podcast this week. We'll be back next week with more Mental Health Monday.